Well, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. Welcome to the first meeting of the CDI Answers CDI training. I am your host, Dr. James Kennedy. This lecture is being given on June um, the 3rd, 2022, uh, and is current as of today. Uh, this is the first lecture of the CDI Answers CDI training which is intended to be given uh, recorded so that it may be listened to prior to uh, the on-site or the on live, the live training. And it is our hope and prayer that you will assimilate this information and uh, study it prior to our meetings so that all of us are on the same page. So to introduce myself, I am a general internist. I am a coder, been doing this for over 20 years. My background is internal medicine, primary care, um, and I'm fairly smart, fairly knowledgeable of this material. My hope and prayer is that I can share with you what I know, how I got to where I am, and what can help you succeed in the CDI arena. So at the end of these of our sessions, my hope is that we will understand the clinical encoding concepts integral to ICD-10 PCS CDI, recognize areas of CDI encoding risk and opportunities, and be part of a solution uh, that advocates the concept of CDI encoding compliance with the implementation of this starting immediately after your training. So in so doing, we will be covering the CDI process, the ICD-10 CM and PCS coding system. We will primarily focus on DRG fundamentals and particularly those involving the Medicare severity DRGs. Uh, so we will cover inpatient reimbursement primarily. To some extent, we will touch some of the other reimbursement methodologies, such as APR, DRGs, HCCs. However, most people, when they start in CDI, they start with the Medicare severity DRGs. And um, this is where we will do in our work. In the process, we will hope that you will start learning the lingo of CDI, various acronyms, uh, POA, HAC, PPC, PPR, MOUSE. There's just so many of these different lingos. And to help you at the end of the slide deck that you have uh, that has been rendered to you is a list of acronyms and a description so that if I use an acronym in our training, and you don't know what that acronym is, hopefully I have placed it or described it towards the back. Uh, I encourage you to look at the acronyms, become familiar with the acronyms so that uh, we can become more conversational with each other uh, in, this, um, in this arena. So again, as I mentioned before, we will be uh, looking at CDI process. We will be covering uh, the ICD-10 system for this lecture that we're doing right now. Recognize that CDI or clinical documentation integrity, in my mind, needs to be viewed from the lens of a coder for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it is the coder that must interact with the physician, and we are their advocates uh, in this interaction. Number two, it is the coder that is the one who is the final word of what gets ultimately billed. And to the extent that we can master what the coder is looking for uh, and the like is an area of opportunity for us and to the extent that I, as a CDI, can relate to them uh, will only help bridge any gaps. And this is what we're going to focus on first. So in short, we are hopeful that you can get some of the references. Uh, 
The coding references, the ICD-10-CM-PCS, can be used offline, and uh, those are not absolutely necessary, though having paper documents usually does help. The DRG expert, uh, I believe, would be very helpful to you, uh, as well as the DRG desk references, both of which focus on the Medicare Severity DRGs. Um, I, can, I would encourage that you get these from Optum. If cost is an issue, they're not absolutely mandatory. But nevertheless, to the extent that you can get access to these, uh, we believe would be a favorable thing to do. We also encourage you to download each of these resources that are at the beginning of your handout, particularly the AHIMA ACDIS CDI practice brief. I cannot emphasize this enough. One needs to memorize what this is saying, and you will be heavily tested on these concepts because without mastery of this CDI practice brief, uh, it would be very difficult uh, to qualify for a job as a new graduate. So one's ability to articulate what's in this practice brief and to be able to use the practice brief or discuss the practice brief with a potential employer uh, is of paramount importance. The rest of these are code sets that can be downloaded to your computer. Uh, these are very helpful in my mind in uh, functioning in the CDI. It can obliviate, obliviate the need to buy a book, uh, and saving these to your computer is a good idea. There's other aspects that could be saved as favorites in an internet browser, and we encourage you to do that. So just to show you in a way how I do it, I do have uh, uh, files on my hard drive uh, that I keep. This is by fiscal year. Fiscal year start in October uh, of the previous year. So like, for example, Fiscal year 2022 started October the 1st, 2021, in September the 30th, 2022. I save everything by fiscal year because every year they're different. So saving these uh, by fiscal year and separating ICD-10-CM or PCS within each fiscal year, in my mind, will save you a, a good amount of time. I also encourage you to become familiar with the CDC's coding tool. Now, this is a computer program, which is free. It's based on the internet. And we'll actually show you how to look up codes. And in fact, it's really quite good. It forces you to use the index first, followed by the table. Uh, it does not, unfortunately, link to any guidelines. It does not link to the coding clinic, but nevertheless, this is where every coder or every CDI should start in looking up a code and your ability to master this or to play with this will help you uh, interact with the coder in a more efficient way. One also needs to pay attention to the procedure coding system, the ICD-10 PCS. We encourage you to download the files, particularly this file to the left, PCS 2023. And you will need that uh, to look through that, to play with that, become familiar with the definitions within this tool, because this will describe all the different root operations, all the various anatomies, some of the tricks of the trade uh, regarding approach. So being conversational with what's in the PCS system uh, is an essential element of what we will be asking you to master. The guidelines. The, there's two guidelines that one must read. And if we're going to do this job, we've got to know the rules. So 
So there's the ICD-10-CM guidelines, which has to do with the diagnoses. There's the PCS guidelines that have to do with the inpatient procedures. Download these, read these, be able to quote these uh, when talking to coders or talking to uh, potential interviewers. Your knowledge of what's in these guidelines uh, will add credibility to your practice. Now, uh, there's other books that uh, one can buy. And the one that I would recommend to you is the CDI Pocket Guide, written by Dr. Richard Pinson and Cynthia Tang. Uh, these are uh, worth purchasing in my mind. There's an alternative from ACDIS that you may look at. It's also good. Um, so I would look at purchasing these one or the other, so that way you are familiar. Uh, these are written for what you're doing. A lot of what I'm saying will be in these books. I encourage you to uh, uh, purchase one of these, either this book or the Actus book, and have that as a reference, because I think you will find that you will look at these every day. I wish that we could get to you an encoder. Uh, today, we don't have access to an encoder uh, for you to use. But nevertheless, you will, we will find that the encoding software is an essential element of of really marrying all of these resources together. And certainly it will be a tool that you will be given uh, should you get a job with someone. However, getting access to an encoder up front is, is a challenge because of their expense. 3M is what most, is what most hospitals use. There's others such as Optum, TrueCode, Nuance. Um, how to get access to these is, uh, we don't have an answer for you yet. If you have a friend who's a coder who would let you play with one, that would be wonderful, but you would need to find a friend that can do that for you. But know that the encoder uh, is a very, very useful tool uh, you may be able to get one from TrueCode, Nuance, Optum. There's a number of different things that you would want to look. But to the extent that if you have the resources and can license an encoder, then that would be wonderful. I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. Get this guideline. Read the guidelines for achieving a compliant query practice, backwards and forwards. The elements that you see on the right is what we will be expecting of you. Uh, you will need to know the types of queries, how to write a query, when to use the word possible in the query, which is never, when can we use other terms of uncertainty, such as likely, suspected, probable, the answer is we can, but we cannot do it prior to discharge, how to keep records, whether we can code off the answers. All of these are going to be necessary for you to understand or else uh, as part of your work. So what we're hoping is that at the end of the day, you will know foundations of the coding system, the ICD-10 PCS, coding conventions, guidelines, and advice. And this will begin your critical thinking journey to determine if the codes that can be assigned from the documentation are accurate, complete, and precise, what risk models uh, uh, that are generated from these codes could be defended with accountability agents, and how to reconcile and address inconsistent, incomplete, and precise or clinically invalid documentation in a manner that colors within the lines and is congruent with the query practice brief that we just discussed. There'll be two types of work 
that you will be involved with. First, what you will likely be doing is what we call reactive CDI, which is cleaning up the inconsistent, incomplete, imprecise documentation that's already in the record, negotiating this with the circumstance, engaging physicians to address identified issues in a compliant manner, and ensuring that the codes that are submitted are accurately are accurate in defining the patient's condition or perhaps even defending these against an accountability agent when challenged or denied. What we hope that you will consider is developing a practice called proactive CDI, which involves standardized definitions of clinical language, uh, what are the what do the words mean? Uh, this, in my mind, will enhance the clinical practice of medicine. How you can integrate this in the electronic health record, partner with other clinicians, wound care, antibiotic stewardship, in standardizing their language, collaborate with executive leadership, management, and the such towards reading common goals and analyzing data that identifies risk and opportunities as the focus improvement activities. As such, critical thinking is an essential element of what we will be asking you to do, which if you have trained as a physician, this is going to be extremely hard because in this, many physicians were taught a certain way of thinking which in coding, it's going to be different. It's going to be, uh, there, the assumptions can't be there. What is intuitive to me as a physician is not intuitive or not concrete for a coder. And this is going to cause, in my mind, a tremendous amount of frustration because the the answer in the thought will be coder. It's obvious. Feathers, quacking, waddling, web feet is in the record. Why can't you report duck? Well, the answer is the doctor didn't say duck. Uh, the physician is going to have to document certain words that are coding language, which may be different than the clinical language that you and I learned in medical school or what we currently read in our literature. So we have to know the difference between type one thinking, type which is intuitive, type two thinking, which is analytical. We have to develop teamwork, communication, professionalism, be in a good work environment. We have to circumvent intuitive thinking with an executive override involving analytical thinking, expand our scope of knowledge, and promote uh, the, the medical decision-making uh, as a we, not a me. So how we interact with each other, how we share our experiences with each other, this is going to probably be the toughest thing and one that you will have to admit or discuss in your potential interview that there is going to be this evolution of thinking involved and how I would approach uh, any potential thinking errors that I come in. I'll just be honest with you. As I started learning this, it took me six to 12 months for me to become more comfortable uh, with this. And I just had to review a lot of charts uh, very quickly. and. Uh, this is something that everybody goes through. You're not unique in this. Just recognize that in this, you will have to study, you will have to learn, you will have to... It, it's just going to take a lot of practice. So what I mean by type 1 intuitive thinking, which is the is fast thinking, it's used to make quick, instinctual decisions where speed is valued over accuracy. Uh, this may be mental shortcuts that allow us to make a decision past judgment quickly. 
And it works best when timeliness is important and the consequences of making an error are small. On the other hand, type two thinking is slower, it's more conscious, where accuracy is more valued than speed. And it works best when timeliness is less important, which you will have time to look at these, though one will have to practice to be more quick because there will be different productivities uh, that are involved uh, in the work that we do. We will also need to be aware of different biases uh, that we bring to what we're doing and being able to confront the biases if they take us down the path of inaccurate uh, thinking. This could be uh, a tendency to lock in on key features of a patient's presentation early in the diagnostic process without adjusting the differential diagnosis based upon new information uh, that comes in. We may be, our, our, our thinking may be clouded by previous experiences uh, and we see what we wanna see. And as such, we may have to be open to seeing things in a different way or thinking of things differently so that we're not, our judgment isn't clouded uh, by such. We also, uh, this is what we call availability bias. Uh, this is otherwise known as jumping to conclusions. It leads to tunnel vision with the minimization of diagnostic possibilities. An example, for an example, for example, an elevated troponin equals myocardial infarction in every case, and that's not true. Uh, there's other reasons for uh, the troponin to be elevated. Not every elevated troponin is a myocardial infarction. Not every low sodium value on a on a lab is hyponatremia. Not every lactate elevation is cardiogenic or shock. And last but not least, we can form a conclusion and then stop thinking. Uh, again, it's very important to be open to new ideas, uh, to, be, to be willing to accept feedback and advice without feeling insecure or or defensive and the such. We're all trying to work together to get it right. At some point in time, though, we do need to drop the ball, see what happens, learn from that, and then move on uh, with what we're trying to do. The good news is that once you master this, there are plenty of potential jobs, clinical documentation improvement specialists, medical informaticists, compliance, consulting, teaching, and such. So hopefully you've had uh, interactions with Scott Edinger at the CDI Search Group, who can give you some feedback into how uh, this works. Uh, one does not have to be licensed to do CDI, though many employers may require it. Coding does not require licensure. Uh, nevertheless, there may be uh, credentials that you need to get and to or get them at least within a certain period of time. And these are things we're hoping that this lectures today will help you attain. So what is CDI? This is my definition. Clinical documentation and coding integrity is the policies, procedures, technology, people, and effort that promote legible, clear, consistent, complete, precise, and non-conflicting and reliable provider documentation essential to final assignment of accurate and clinically congruent HIPAA-associated transaction set codes and their submission to all accepting entity. So it's not just the query, it's not a person, it's a process, which represents a joint effort between a provider and a coder to, ach 
achieve complete and accurate documentation, code assignment, and reporting of diagnoses and procedures, for which the importance of consistent, which means non-conflicting and complete documentation in the record cannot be overemphasized. This is part of the ICD-10 guidelines, which means that CDI is legal and what you're doing is absolutely appropriate. So we will be focusing uh, on the code sets. CPT is what's used in outpatient facility billing and by physicians. This lecture will not focus on this, we will be focusing more on the diagnosis coding and the inpatient procedures. But nevertheless, a knowledge of CPT will, may help with physician engagement, and one does need to be reasonably conversational regarding that. Good news is that CDI is not only legal, it is encouraged. This uh, lawsuit in Texas uh, said that CMS is well aware of CDI activities, and they don't, they understand that this will improve payment. On the other hand, if you, if one is pushing for diagnoses that cannot be supported by the patient circumstances, that could be considered to be upcoding, of which upcoding is fraudulent, right coding is not. This is exemplified by a current lawsuit uh, against Kaiser, which is a uh, hospital system uh, primarily on the West Coast, but in other cities like Atlanta, Georgia, and in the Northeast, where Kaiser is being held accountable for the clinical validity of their codes, what they call leading queries, uh, what qualifies as a codable diagnosis, uh, whether or not um, it should be applied to a patient's encounter. And we want to be aware of this. Even the uh, federal, the United States federal government inspector general is scrutinizing malnutrition. So just because a doctor wrote malnutrition in the record, we as CDI specialists have to be cognizant of what these are and to what extent that we can um, uh, so not only that the patient had malnutrition, but it was treated. And so you will be responsible for knowing that and to working with the coders, working with your compliance officers uh, in this arena. So as such, uh, we have mentioned that CDI is servant leadership. We are here to help the doctor. We are here to help the coder. We serve both. In essence, you might call us marriage counselors because physicians have one way of looking at things. Coders have a different way of looking at things. And to the extent that we can uh, manage this together, in my opinion, is an area of opportunity for us uh, and we have to be able to know both sides. If I, since I was trained as a clinician, I was really good at talking to the doctor about clinical things. My challenge was learning to talk to a coder. On the other hand, if your background is coding and you're not uh, able to speak clinically to a doctor, then that is going, there's going to be communication barriers and, um, um, and we will want to be um, uh, cognizant of that in what we're doing. So therefore, your work in CDI, while it will be primarily engaged with queries to start with, you may be also be part of building uh, informatics. You may be part of building, um, building um, uh, working with service lines. Uh, you may be involved with dealing with other ancillaries such as dietitians, wound care, respiratory therapy, and the like. So uh, you will be the face of the pro of the process. Part of what we have to do with CDI is we have to sell. 
it's important to know what we're doing. We got to sell. We got to engage. We need to bring people into our circle. We have to solve the problems uh, that are in front of us. And so this is what you will be doing. This is what you're going to be part of. And what we're hoping to do is to teach you some of the fundamentals uh, that go with this. The executive leadership of, of physician advisors, the C-suite, the chief executive officer, the chief medical officer, the chief financial officer will be, will be essential uh, to managing this, to supporting your work, and they will be relied upon to block and tackle uh, for situations that you're not able to handle yourself. Anytime that there's a shared relationship between two different individuals, while they may have equal responsibilities, there are different roles. Same thing with CDI. Physicians have unique roles and responsibilities that are different than the coders, and you as a CDI will need to mitigate both of these. The physician will have the responsibility of defining the conditions uh, or the therapeutic terminologies. What is acute kidney failure versus acute kidney insufficiency? When does a localized infection become sepsis? When is it an excisional debridement versus a non-excisional debridement? Their different doctors will have different reasons or different approaches to this. And the standardization of this will be the medical staff responsibility, of course, with your health. The, pay, the f provider needs to make a diagnosis or describe the patient treatments. That is their responsibility. We cannot do that for them. The provider has to document this in the record. Uh, we may recognize that the feathers quacking waddling is a web feet is a duck, but unless the physician says duck, we cannot code duck. We even may even need the specificity of whether it's a male duck or a female duck. Uh, what type of species is it? Is uh, is the duck? So these are the levels of specificity that the physician or the provider is responsible for. And it's our job to work with them to get that in the record. Which means that we as CDIs and uh, or coders have to be able to decipher the record. We have to recognize unclear, inconsistent, incomplete, imprecise documentation and their circumstances and how they would be coded delineate with these circumstances with providers, typically through a query process, or perhaps with electronic medical record redesign and such. Uh, what documented diagnoses or treatment should be used in the context of their actual occurrence? Deploy the codes based upon the coding conventions, and then at the end of the day, both the doctor and the CDI and the coder has to defend whether or not the patient had the condition, how it was documented, how it was coded. This is what I call the seven Ds of CDI. And everything that you and I do in this will somehow touch one of these seven Ds. And of course, definitions start first because words matter. Um, it's not just every doctor for himself. Facilities and payers may require a physician use a clinical definition of terms when establishing a diagnosis for clinical validation processes. But nevertheless, that is a uh, that's a clinical issue outside the coding system. Uh, coders can only code what was documented in the record. And we know that a good lawyer knows the law, the better lawyer knows the law, the judge and the jury. While the coders can code only what the doctor documents, unless we are certain that these documentation and codes can pass the smell test or the retrospective scrutiny, 
we may at some time be having to have some conversations with the physician of bringing these issues up without them feeling that we're challenging their medical decision making. So our ability to cite literature, to na navigate, negotiate, and not alienate is going to be part of what we have to do. Part of us as students is we're going to have to learn this material, become more confident, and have a conversation with a provider that uh, in a way that uh, gets that assures the accuracy of the code that's being rendered. So you as a uh, um, uh, as a CDI are going to have to learn a various amounts types of clinical concepts. So these are extremely crucial. Uh, these are listed on the screen, and I'm not going to go over them. But it will be important for you to be conversational of the clinical indicators of what you see here on the screen uh, along various organ systems. You may choose to specialize in a certain organ system, particularly if, if you work at a ho larger hospital uh, that could like have a cardiology service line, a trauma service line, and the like. But just be aware that there's different uh, clinical concepts that we're going to need to be sensitive to, and we're going to need to be able to talk about these, what defines them, and how we intersect the clinical language with the coding language that we're going to be talking about later. One will also have to learn relationships between different diagnoses. Uh, and it's these relationships between conditions or diagnoses or symptoms that can make or break a risk adjustment or a code. And a mnemonic that I use is MUSIC, M-U-S-I-C. A condition has five components. It has a manifestation, an underlying cause or pathology, severity or specificity, instigating cause or consequences. So for example, uh, a ch I have an abnormal chest x-ray. Is it that the manifestation is a fever, elevated white count, pleuritic chest pain, and an infiltrate? Well, what's the underlying cause of this? Well, pneumonia is is quite common. It could also be a pulmonary infarction. It could also be atelectasis. So how we know the differences between pneumonia, pulmonary infarction, and atelectasis is going to be something that we have to think alongside of the physician, you know, in, these, in this light. Let's say that it is pneumonia. Uh, uh, is what is the organism that's involved in the pneumonia? Is it due to or in the setting of influenza or other causes? Unfortunately, for coding purposes, hospital acquired, healthcare acquired, community acquired does not affect coding since coding is organism specific, not location specific. So even if the doctor says nosocomial or healthcare associated pneumonia, we're going to have to get additional specificity since the coding system is organism driven. What instigated or precipitated the pneumonia? It could have been the oral pharyngeal dysphagia as the late effect of stroke. It could be a toxic encephalopathy due to a drug overdose resulting in aspiration. Ventilator use. Uh, or it could be the setting of an immunocompromised state, not just HIV infections, but it could be steroid use. It could be adverse effects of cancer chemotherapy, other inherited immune deficiencies, and sickle cell disease, so on and so forth, due to a splenectomy. So what is the immunocompromised state? 
And certainly, what were the consequences of the pneumonia? Did it result in sepsis or severe sepsis? Did it result in respiratory failure? Did it result in a pleural effusion or an empyema? And to the extent that we can say due to, caused by, resulting in, it's going to be an essential element of our work because these relationships, these interdependencies with each other will give us a more complete code and more than likely will uh, more than likely will increase the relative weight or the risk adjustment. One of the things that I have to do when I'm reviewing a record is that if I see something documented in the chart, I'm going to pick, let's say, pneumonia is documented in the chart. I need to put it in one of these five categories and then look to see if the documentation is in the record for the other four. Were the manifestations documented? Was the specificity documented? Was the instigating cause or the consequences? And this is was the due to, the cause by, the resulting in, the linking terms in the record. These are things that I'm going to need to do myself because that's going to help me focus what I need to query for, what was inconsistent or incomplete or imprecise in the medical record. And my use of this music algorithm is what helps me remember what I need to do in order to get the record uh, coded completely and accurately to start with. So as such, as you're developing your critical thinking, it is essential that uh, we rely upon credible uh, clinical literature, which is uh, which can be obtained from the internet. Of course, some of this does cost money. Access to a medical library would be phenomenally helpful. Uh, However, we recognize that not everybody may have access to a medical library. I would say that many times if you have, if you're close to a hospital, you can actually get on their internet system, like in the cafeteria or just on campus somewhere. And some of these, some of these databases that we're about to discuss can actually be accessed uh, uh, while on the hospital internet. And I would say that this is an area, uh, you know, using the literature is an extremely important thing to do. So if you are not aware of this, the National Library of Medicine in the United States has a website called pubmed.gov, which I, I would go here first because not uncommonly there is there are free materials uh, that are definitional of certain conditions that I'm looking at, and I could certainly uh, start, I would start here because this is, uh, everyone recognizes who the journals are in the NLM, and PubMed.gov is an extremely important website to look at. Another one that I like in particular is up to date. Now, of course, to subscribe to this by yourself is fairly expensive. This is where, again, um, going to a hospital, uh, uh, getting on up to date, signing up for your own account. The fact that you're on the hospital's intranet, they will give you access to up to date in many hospitals. And you're a bit, and then you can then take that access off campus. Now it expires like in 28 days or whatever, but nevertheless, this uh, up to date clinical key, Ovid, a number of these sorts of websites, uh, in my mind, will give you the ability to uh, to look at these and then use regular literature in order to substantiate your thinking because physicians like literature. Physicians like seeing something from their own specialty group. 
that's late, that's current, and your ability to show them that helps the doctor become a better clinician uh, in what he or she is doing, and I, in my experience, will enhance your credibility as well. So in the end, specialty journals, I believe, are, are much are very credible and uh, will help uh, with medical staff in having the greatest impact. Also be aware that there are a number of guideline pages, which are part of your handouts, which I encourage you to look at, uh, to go through these. You will find many, many, many of these uh, defining certain conditions. So we will try to reference many of these during our time together uh, with these, but I'm giving you a sense of where these come from, and these are all part of your, uh, again, these are in your handout. Also, uh, getting alerts from various high-impact journals uh, that you can read helps you keep up to date, and, and so references to these are part of your handout. We encourage you to sign up for what's interesting to you, and uh, again, maintaining one's clinical competence in this arena is, um, is in my mind, uh, uh, a very uh, important part of learning, staying up to date, and demonstrating your growth uh, in what you're doing. Uh, Dr. Pinson, again, does try to keep up himself and will incorporate these in the books. Uh, but nevertheless, we still have our own responsibilities in doing this. Another aspect of CDI is being part of a group. And uh, there's two groups that are focused on CDI. One is a not-for-profit group called the American Health Information Management Association. And they are a cooperating party to the coding system and thus, what they, the statements they may make are industry standards. They're not as clinical as I would like for them to be, but they do represent coders, and I would say has a very strong, um, uh, being a member of a HEMA is, uh, is a very worthy of a strong consideration. ACDIS, on the other hand, is a for-profit company that has done a very good job of developing networking uh, and such. However, they it is a conduit for them selling their books, their classes and such. Uh, they are not the professional organization in AHIMA that AHIMA is, but in my mind, they are, uh, it is worthy to be part of them uh, because there are a lot of, of people involved with CDI. So I mentioned, uh, become familiar with them. If you sign up to get their emails, know that more often than not, you're going to get a pitch to buy a book or something of that nature. Uh, they are a for-profit company, and yes, that's what they do. Certification is an important area. Uh, the easiest one probably to get at the beginning is the CDIP. This is administered by a HEMA. It's probably the easiest one to get early in one's career. Uh, the eligibility is either a coding credential or medical record credential or an associate's degree uh, or higher. So if one has graduated from a nursing school or a medical school, that part is is uh, is satisfied then one uh, would have to take a test and then once you pass the test you have the certification of course there has to be a maintenance of that certification uh, by getting continuing education hours but nevertheless this is uh, they do recommend that you have a working knowledge of coding experience, CDI experience, but it is not required. 
On the other hand, uh, there's others which uh, the CCS is more uh, focused on inpatient coding. If this would be a very strong uh, credential to get because this qualifies a CDI specialist with a coder. It really puts that person in the coder's shoes. Um, another is the CCDS, which is administered by Actus. It, it, is for, it is limited to four years. It requires ongoing Actus accreditation uh, and such. It focuses on non-provider nurses uh, who want to enter CDI practice, but they'll want to identify as a coder. But nevertheless, the, uh, both of these are worth getting. And I would say that you want to be attended, uh, sensitive to these. Getting the CDIP, however, is a good place to start. But at some point in time, you will probably be required to get one or both of these certifications and go into their various websites uh, to learn more of these is strongly encouraged. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with codes. We're, uh, the first code that set we're dealing with, it's called ICD-10 uh, without the CM, of which ICD-10 without the CM is an international classification that operates throughout the world. In fact, ICD-10-CM for the planet has already, um, I mean, ICD-10 without the CM for the planet has already been uh, replaced with ICD-11. What you will be learning is ICD-10-CM, which is uh, developed in the United States, along with ICD-10 procedural coding system, which is ICD-10 PCS, also developed in the United States and is used in the United States for inpatient procedures. So this is, these are well explained in the guidelines that I've asked you to read. Uh, so we won't go into a lot of detail of these, but I do encourage you to become familiar with these guidelines uh, read these backwards and forwards and become so that you can at least be conversational uh, of this. Another document that you that you likely will not have access to uh, unless you have access to an encoder is the American Hospital Association's coding clinic for ICD-10 CMPCS. Now, where I see the coding clinic differs from the conventions and the guidelines that I mentioned for, for previous is that ICD-10, the coding clinic, is official advice that interprets the conventions, that interprets the guidelines according to the questions that have been sent. And it's very much like a Supreme Court uh, rendering the judgment of what a coder can do or cannot do. I This is going to be important to at least acknowledge and in the conversations and what we do, we have to be aware of the of coding clinic. Unfortunately, this is not a public domain. To purchase coding clinic is somewhat expensive. This is why, again, access to an encoder that can give you, uh, that has the coding clinic in it, along with the guidelines, along with uh, um, coding software, grouping software, uh, is an area that you will want to be conversational or at least no knowledge of. But be aware that you will hear the term coding clinic uh, discussed in CDI, and it deserves the respect that a Supreme Court will get because the coding clinic is uh, very important for what coders look at and something that you will need to be aware of yourself. So what is ICD-10-CM? 
Well, it is, a, in essence, it is a modification of the worldwide ICD-10 that is used in the United States. And it does have some differences that the, that the Centers for Disease Control believes that, I, that disease entities in the United States should be, um, uh, should be reporting. So, unfortunately, ICD-10 is like a telephone book. Lots of interesting characters, different uh, terrible plot. It's a, it is a dictionary without definitions. It has terminology, it has letters and numbers that go with those terminologies, but it doesn't define the characteristics of these, of these entities. So this is something that uh, uh, you will have to get other, uh, other uh, uh, definitions from, because these are, uh, this is, uh, notice that there's no definitions of the terms uh, that are listed in these. Uh, these are going to have to be determined by the doctor and negotiated by the coding and CDI department. Uh, in this light. So here's another example that we would want to be looking at. Um, heart failure. Notice that in ICD-10, heart failure is classified as systolic and diastolic. It is further classified as acute and chronic. Notice that they use the terms heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HFREF, and heart failure with normal or preserved ejection fraction, HFPEF. What defines heart failure? What defines uh, systolic or diastolic heart failure? What is a normal ejection fraction? What is preserved? What is reduced? When is it acute? When is it chronic? These are terms that uh, we think we know. However, if I, as a CDI specialist, am not able to know myself, how can I ascertain whether or not the doctor knows? So these are things that I hope uh, you will have to master. And how will we be able to do that? So notice that ICD-10 does not tell us, so we have to look for other options uh, with, regarding this. So this is where, again, the clinical literature comes into play. Uh, this is an article from JAMA Cardiology in 2016 which talked about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction of less than 40%, minimally reduced is less than is 40 to 49%, and preserved or normal ejection fraction is 50% or higher. So therefore, reduced ejection fraction is less than 50% because minimally reduced is still reduced. So this is where the literature came out with this in 2016. Uh, the physician, however, still has to say our failure with preserved or reduced ejection fraction, because if the doctor writes heart failure and says ejection fraction of like 20%, the coder cannot assume that it's reduced unless the doctor says it's reduced. So this is going to be part of your job in what you will do. A more recent definition that is extremely credible is the 2021 universal definition of, of heart failure, which again, I encourage you to read. This was published in April 2021, which goes again, it defines what heart failure is as a clinical syndrome with current or prior symptoms caused by a structural or functional cardiac disease and is correlated at least with objective evidence of pulmonary edema or systemic congestion or elevated 
uh, brain uh, natriuretic peptides, there's that risk, pre-heart failure, heart failure, stage C, and advanced heart failure. And then the classification is what we just discussed earlier, the 50-50 uh, type thing, whereby language matters. We said that before, didn't we? Uh, and um, how the doctor defines, diagnosis, and documents this is of primary importance, which we are going to help. Now, what is acute heart failure? Well, there's no one definition clinically of what acute heart failure is. Probably the best definition of acute heart failure is the new onset or recurrence of symptoms that requires urgent or emergent therapy that results in unscheduled care. So if the patient is like an end-stage heart failure, they're going to have dysmia. They're going to have, they're going to be rocking along. But if the symptoms get so bad that urgent and e or emergent therapy is needed and the care is unscheduled, uh, then that is what's going to qualify as acute. And this is going to be an essential element of how we discuss that with our physicians. The term decompensated means acute on chronic. In fact, uh, the universal definition of heart failure likes the word decompensated as opposed to acute, because acute, that is really more of what is going on. Uh, and coding actually rep, uh, un, will actually let us take the term decompensated to mean acute on chronic phase. So uh, th these are the type of terminologies, these are the type of definitions that I need to be familiar with, and you do too. Uh, so again, what is systolic heart failure? What is diastolic heart failure? What is acute heart failure, what is chronic, what is decompensated, and the like are going to be essential elements. Well, Dr. Kennedy, why do I need to know all this? Why are hospitals looking for CDI specialists uh, in this regard? Here's why. First and foremost, this involves DRG, or diagnosis-related group payment. So a 65-year-old uh, is admitted for colon resection who is documented to have a history of congestive heart failure. Postoperatively, the doctor is documented to said that the heart failure is decompensated. And notice that there's three tiers of the diagnosis-related groups for colectomy. There is what they call without the CC, which CC or MCC means comorbidity complication or major comorbidity complication. So if, if the patient's healthy, has their colectomy, the hospital gets $13,000 uh, for all the work that they did in preparing the operating room for that. Unfortunately, decompensated CHF is not a CC. It keep, it's at the paid at the lower level of $13,684. But on the other hand, systolic or diastolic CHF without decompensation is a CC Notice that there's a $6,710 between the difference between the DRG331 and 330. So what you will need to look at the record, you may be called upon to say, hey, doc, you wrote CHF in the record. Is it systolic, diastolic, or something else? And that would add $6,710 to the hospitalization. Or in this situation, because the doctor's already documented decompensated uh, heart failure, decompensated systolic or decompensated diastolic heart failure 
is an MCC and results in $39,000, which is $25,406 from the DRG that was without CCMCC. So the work that you will be doing will add $25,000 to the revenue because the doctor only wrote decompensated CHF. And you will need to be able to recognize when it's decompensated. You would need to know the difference between the, um, the systolic heart failure, the diastolic heart failure, and be able, using that query practice brief, approach the physician in a, in a proper way uh, in order to get the CC or the MCC. And that is, in essence, what your job is going to be doing to start with. So there'll be other things involved, but this is representative of what we will be talking about, how we will be training you, as to know what the CCs and MCCs are so that we can accurately reflect that in the record. So this means that you're going to need to learn how to code to some extent and recognize that when you look at those coding materials that I gave you earlier, there's two parts to the ICD-10-CM. That's what they call first the alphabetic index, where one first looks up the code, and then we verify the code in the what they call the tabular list, which will then have additional instructions as to what to do with the code and where to place the code uh, within the record. So I will, let's say I have a patient with diabetes and they have chronic kidney disease. So notice that um, notice that um, diabetes with, now the word with, if the word with is in a code title, it means it's automatically linked to that condition uh, unless the doctor delinks it by describing another cause. But notice I will do diabetes with, and you see chronic kidney disease, it points to that E11.22. I then go to my tabular list, and notice how my E11.22 uh, will point to that type 2 diabetes with diabetic chronic kidney disease. And there's going to be another instruction under that to use an additional code for the stage of the chronic kidney disease. And I've added these down below, but notice I haven't, I don't have all of them on this, but they're there. And so the doctor would need to identify which stage of the chronic kidney disease. And this is how you would look up the code. Uh, in this, and you would need to do this for all of these conditions. So there's my use additional code. It also it then notices it has other code first instructions. So notice that uh, the instruction I cannot use the N18 code first. I have to code first the 11 E11.22 uh, first, followed by the uh, N18 code that's applicable to the situation. But this is how a coder should look up a code. And this is what you're going to have to get some practice in doing yourself in order to um, be able to um, navigate some of the pitfalls and booby traps uh, that you may encounter in your work. Or let's take diabetes, for example. Uh, and recognize that some patients with diabetes are well controlled and some may not be controlled. Uh, so then when we look at the diabetes standards for 2022, uh, typically to have well-controlled diabetes, the hemoglobin A1C needs to be less than 7%, though in some circumstances less than 8% uh, may be appropriate for certain patients. 
Um, or isolated blood sugars should be um, less than 180 because if they're over 180, that means level one hyperglycemia, and that is predictive of poor patient outcomes. So these are the standards of care for diabetes. Now, if a doctor documents, again, diabetes out of control, the index will say that the, will allow me to say that the patient's hyperglycemic. If the doctor documents that the diabetes is poorly controlled, again, I can say that the patient's hyperglycemic. On the other hand, if the doctor says uncontrolled diabetes, I have to query because uncontrolled diabetes, the index says it could either be hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. But if the doctor doesn't say hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, then I can't code the hyperglycemia, even if the blood sugar is over 180. So therefore, part of what you will have to do uh, is recognize that uncontrolled diabetes cannot be coded as hyperglycemia. You either have to have the doctor say the hyperglycemia if the blood sugar is above 180 or if the hemoglobin A1C is above 7 or 8, then or they're going to have to say poorly controlled or out of control, which might cause your physicians to be frustrated. But this is just the way it works. This is just the way uh, the, the coding system is set up. And what will make your job probably a little bit more difficult than if than if it'd been more straightforward. The predicament for this and the reason that we're dealing with this is that uh, code assignment is based only on what the doctor writes. It is not a clinical interpretation or a data abstraction by the coder. Uh, so therefore, if the hematocrit is 25, even though you and I both know that the patient's anemic, the doctor has to say anemia in order to code anemia. If the serum sodium is 125, the doctor has to say hyponatremia. Again, I want to emphasize to you that this may be one of your most problematic areas because we, if if you trained as a nurse or a clinician or a physician of sort, we will look at the lab values. We will get the diagnosis in our head. We know what the doctor meant, but because the doctor didn't write it down, uh, we can't code it. And you're going to have to ask the physician in a non-leading way to add a diagnosis to the record that uh, may be obvious to him. But just like that diabetes example, uh, it would be different than what that doctor would do. And that could be somewhat clumsy sometimes. And how, how we navigate these uh, is part of the skill of what you will be required in your job. Good news is that we may use uh, other physicians other than the attending physician. If there's no conflicting information, even we can use house staff documentation and physician's assistance and nurse practitioner documentation to obtain a code, provided that there's no conflicting information. If there is conflicting information, then the attending physician has to be uh, addressed uh, in order to clarify uh, the conflict. Uh, so the neurologist may have said stroke, the attending may have said transient ischemic attack. You would need to go to the attending, uh, not the neurologist, in order to clarify uh, what should be reported for coding purposes. There are some exceptions, however. Uh, they're very limited for diagnoses. Body mass index the death of a non-pressure chronic ulcer, a pressure ulcer stage, coma scales, NIH stroke scales, social determinants of health, laterality, and like 
can be coded from nursing documentation or respiratory therapy documentation. But on the other hand, there must be associated with these terms an applicable diagnosis such that I can't code a body mass index documented by a nurse unless there's a weight-related diagnosis such as diagnosis such as underweight, obesity, or malnutrition. While the wound care nurse may have given me a skin ulcer stage, it is the provider's responsibility to say the location of the skin ulcer and whether it's venous stasis or pulp pressure. If there's a blood alcohol level, the doctor still needs to say the patient has a toxic encephalopathy or drunk. And we are not allowed to code the coma scales unless there is a traumatic brain injury. So coma scales don't help me unless there's a TBI. And this is something that you will need to become familiar with. As I mentioned before, you do need to be familiar with the guidelines uh, for diagnoses and because of uh, the guidelines will have different rules for hospitals uh, as opposed to providers. For example, in the guidelines for a hospital, inpatient hospital, we can code an uncertain diagnosis documented at the time of discharge. Again, key, documented at the time of discharge. This means discharge order, Discharge note or discharge summary, not the HMP, not the progress note. Discharge summary, discharge note, discharge order. If the diagnosis documented at the time of discharge is qualified as probable, suspected, likely, questionable, possible, or still to be ruled out, code the consistent condition as if it existed or was established. So, and so long as it passes the smell test. On the other hand, outpatient bill facility or any physician billing, even if it's inpatient, do not code the diagnosis documented as probable, suspected, possible, and the like, unless, you know, you just can't do it. You can only code to the different levels of specificity. Uh, and such. So this is the, you know, so again, there may be certain rules in the guidelines of what a facility can do that an MD can't do and vice versa, and you those may need to be negotiated as such. The guidelines also remind us that we cannot code laboratory values, abnormal lab values, unless the provider it, indicates their clinical significance. Uh, this, is, uh, this is pertinent to an inpatient environment because on the outpatient environment, if there is a diagnostic test that has been interpreted by a provider, then we can code those. Otherwise, uh, uh, the physician has to state their clinical significance. On the inpatient environment, we cannot code results of x-rays because again that is the role of a physician with face-to-face -face contact however we can get the location of a documented condition from the x-ray if it's in the x-ray report itself on the outpatient environment uh, an interpreting physician we can take it from that but if it's a faith a physician with face-to-face -face cut uh, contact, that physician would have to indicate why that interpreted diagnosis uh, should be, uh, it has to be documented by him and why it pertained uh, to the encounter. Unfortunately, even on the inpatient environment, we cannot code directly from the PATH report, even if the even since the uh, even since the uh, interpreting pathologist is a doctor, so this may be a little bit cumbersome uh, with your surgeons because the surgeon will do an operation.
The PATH report will come after the patient's been discharged. We will still need to be able to come to the surgeon to be able to get that report. So this is a predicament of PATH reports. We can't get these uh, from them and we would need to render a query. Now, what I'm showing you is a query example that could per perhaps be rendered uh, that goes with that practice brief. And uh, it says, dear doctor, this, this uh, path report shows X, you know, uh, yes, I agree with it. Or if the doctor doesn't agree with it, he can say it's a but benign neoplasm, a malignant neoplasm, you know, something of that nature. But these are the sorts of communications that you will have to be rendering. And notice that we have the option of other or cannot clinically determine. Uh, this is an example of what a query might look like. We'll go more into this when we go over the query practice brief. Another diagnosis consideration that you will need to encounter is what we call the present on admission indicator. These are whether or not a condition was present or resolved prior to the time that the inpatient order is written. So this is based again on the time of the inpatient order. It could be also called the present at the time of inpatient order or patio indicator instead of present on admission. And the answers could be yes, no, or cannot be clinically determined. Yes is no penalty, no that there's a penalty, cannot be clinically determined is uh, considered to be a yes. So present on admission indicators will be something that you will be, uh, that we will be covering. Another coding concept in diagnosis is the concept of history of. Many physicians will document in the medical record that the patient has a history of diabetes and a history of lung disease or a history of this and a history of that. Well, his, and many physicians will think of history to mean that the patient has the condition. ICD-10, on the other hand, considers history of is no longer present and not being treated. So therefore, the predicament that we have in this is that sometimes we have to differentiate whether it's a history of a condition or the presence of a condition. Probably the most important decision after coding a record is the principal diagnosis. The, the principal diagnosis is described in ICD-10 as that condition established after study to be chiefly responsible for occasioning the inpatient admission of the hospital for care based upon the circumstances of the inpatient admission order, the diagnostic approach and the treatment rendered. Notice that this is the condition established after study. This may not be on the HMP. This was maybe discovered later. Uh, this is probably the most difficult decision that we will have to make as a CDI and many coders will have trouble with this and how we work with them in the definition of the principal diagnosis is an area that's going to need to be mastered. We will also need to be looking at additional diagnoses or secondary diagnoses. Just because the doctor writes something in the record doesn't need, mean it can be coded unless there is evidence that it was clinically evaluated, therapeutically treated, diagnostic procedures were involved, uh, there was an increasing length of stay or monitoring and such, uh, you would need to be able to show that uh, with the coder or perhaps work with the coder of how the documentation involved with that uh, was addressed. 
One exception, however, are chronic conditions. So what do you do with a chronic condition like COPD where there is no active treatment? The coding clinic did give an exception for chronic conditions such as hypertension, Parkinson's disease, COPD, and diabetes as chronic systemic conditions for inpatient coding. So therefore, these are conditions that by themselves are stable, uh, they're always present, they are considered by the physician to, in evaluating the patient's chief complaint. They affect a major body system. Uh, so therefore, on the inpatient environment, there's a lot more leeway for the chronic conditions because it is perceived that those will always affect an inpatient environment. On the other hand, the outpatient environment is completely, completely different. The doctor has to be explicit that the documented condition um, well, that the documented condition did receive treatment or care for the condition uh, and such. And um, so this has been this is going to be a point of contention, particularly if one does CDI in the outpatient environment because of the, uh, an example is, was in the coding clinic, uh, third quarter 2020, a patient was seen in the emergency room for strep throat. Well, the doctor also documented the patient had attention deficit disorder, uh, anxiety, manic depression, post-traumatic stress. However, all the e emergency room doctor did was treat the strep throat because these were not addressed by the physician, uh, we cannot code these chronic uh, mental disorders unless the physician documented that they impacted the current visit in some way. This was re-emphasized in the coding clinic third quarter 2021, that just because a patient is receiving a drug uh, for a condition, or a, uh, it's in a problem list or a history, the physician has to state that the drug is being used to treat the condition, such as insulin is being used to treat diabetes or uh, anisol uh, or, or steroids are being used to treat Crohn's disease. Um, there does have to be some consideration of the impact of the diagnosis on that uh, condition. But unless, so like for example, uh, if there is no provider documentation that their treatment affected patient care, do not code the condition. So unless the doctors, the doctor may say the patient has, has diabetes and may list insulin, but unless the doctor says that the patient's diabetes is being treated with insulin, then we cannot code the diabetes on the outpatient environment. So if it is, this is again an area that you may be involved with in wanting to query the physician for these. And uh, if we're not certain, then we have to query the provider for clarification. So a couple of acronyms that we look at on the outpatient environment for diagnosis coding is um, did the, was the documented condition monitored, evaluated, assessed, or treated? Or another one that's called the MEET criteria. Another one is TAMPER. Was there treatment, assessment, monitoring, plan, evaluation, or referral? Uh, if you're really not certain about these, uh, they're not clear, then the physician would need to be queried. Let me just say again that uh, for the diagnosis part, read the guidelines. Uh, certain aspects of this uh, is knowing the difference between excludes one versus excludes two. The automatic linkage words, which are and and with. Code first versus use additional code. Essential or non-essential modifiers, principal diagnoses, 
All of these need to be covered, and we expect you to at least to have had a working knowledge of these uh, so that we can be more conversational in what your role as a CDI specialist will be. Let's change gears a little bit and go to inpatient procedures. Uh, this is for the PCS system that we had discussed, which is used by the inpatient facilities, whereas on the other hand, the physician is going to be using CPT. So this is going to be a little different, and um, so just be aware of this. So, but unlike the diagnosis coding, uh, the PCS coding can be taken from anywhere in the record, uh, even by a nurse or even by a respiratory therapist or a physical therapist or somebody in the record, because this may be the only evidence that the procedure uh, was performed. So this is a little bit good because uh, you could look throughout the record for that. If a wound care registered nurse does a wound debridement, we don't have to query the physician of whether or not a wound debridement was done. This was done by a nurse. So the good news is that you don't have to take it. Uh, you can get uh, procedure documentation from anywhere in the record uh, where the service was being done. So you will need to become a little bit familiar with how PCS codes are constructed Unlike the ICD-10 diagnosis codes, every PCS code has seven digits, and each digit has a, has a meaning or something that you would need to become familiar with. So notice that there is a, a, a body system uh, operation, which we also call root operation. There's specificity of body parts, uh, patient approach, and then other clarifiers regarding devices or uh, other qualifiers. So these are areas that your work in this will be more than likely the intent of the operation, which goes to the root operation, what exactly the body part that was operated on, and whether or not some of the different qualifiers that vary according to the different codes because different ones of these have different uh, resource allocations and have different impacts on the DRG. Uh, they do follow the same, uh, to look up the PCS code, again, follows the same uh, clarification that we saw with diagnoses. The only difference, however, is that we don't have to use the index. We can use the table directly. However, the index is a very good place to start. So notice that there is an abdominoplasty. Notice that it has three different root operations, alteration, repair, supplement. I picked alteration on this, and notice that the abdominoplasty, uh, it goes to O-W-O-F, so notice that it's O-W-O-F, F is the body part at the abdominal wall, and then the, uh, the various approaches, the devices, the qualifiers would then have to be added. And um, these are, this is how one would look up a code in this situation. So learning the root operations, it's going to be an extremely important aspect of this. You go back to that file that I just showed you, that PCS 2023. The definitions of the root operations are on page 1158 of the PDF. And you will want to become familiar with these. And a couple of examples that I've given to you is revision, excision, resection, and extraction. Revision is the correcting to the extent possible of a portion of a malfunctioning device or position of a displaced device. This is not end of life, like for uh, a device worn out and just needs to be replaced. 
end of life is not malfunctioning or it's not displaced. So we wouldn't use the revision root operation for that. We would use another one. Notice that there's excision, which is a portion of a body part. There's resection, which is the removal of all of a body part. And then we have um, uh, extraction, which is the pulling or stripping of a body part by the use of force. And where this comes into play is in tissue debridement. Tissue debridement is the removal of non-viable material formed bodies or poorly healing tissue from a wound of which in ICD-10, there's going to be different root operations of extraction, excision, you know, and the like. And then there's going to be different levels uh, based upon whether it's just the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, fascia, muscle, or bone. We code to the, to the deepest level uh, of the debridement. And in the Medicare Severity DRG system, an excisional debridement, which is the root operation of excision, is higher weighted than the non-excisional debridements, which use the root operation of extraction or extirpation. In fact, here's a pressure ulcer of the left elbow. Notice that if the doctor wrote stark debridement, we only get paid $6,528. But if the doctor says excisional debridement of subcutaneous tissue or skin, we get $8,800, almost a $2,300 bump uh, in the reimbursement. Notice that a sharp debridement of fascia is $6,500. Excisional debridement of fascia adds again $2,300. But notice that if we go even deeper, excisional or sharp debridement of a muscle starts off at $11,000. If it's involving the bone, we get $13,000. So again, the specificity of what was debrided uh, and such is, an, is, is crucial. Notice that sharp, if there's osteomyelitis of the radial bone, sharp debridement of the radial bone is $10,000, whereas $10,600 excisional debridement of the radial bone with the scalpel is $12,400. And this is, again, remember that coding clinic that we just described? It is the coding clinic that tells us that sharp debridement does not equal excisional debridement, and that excisional debridement must involve the use of a scalpel. So um, this is the documentation that has to be in the record uh, in order to get the higher weighted DRG which you will be responsible for. So this is just a number of different advices that again, the term sharp debridement is not allowed. Uh, I would just recommend that you read these. Uh, it says that if a, if a doctor debrides an abdominal cavity, removing necrotic tissue and bone by sharp debridement, does the word excision need to be in here? The answer is yes. The coding clinic, which is the Supreme Court, told us that we have to do that. And does the um, notice that Dr. wrote debridement of bone, fascia, or muscle without saying excisional debridement? Uh, can the coder assume that? The answer is no. So this is going to be your ability to articulate this with the coder using the coding clinic advice will help you, uh, will show the coder that you're sensitive to this and that you're on their level in, in working this out. So there's going to be other root operations that you will need to become familiar with, um, resection, excision, so on and so forth. 
and again, I encourage you to read those root operations in the PCS manual as you prepare for the class that you will be attending. Essential that again, that you read the PCS guidelines. Uh, there's a number of things in this. Uh, the table should always be consulted. Physicians are not expected to have to use the terms in the PCS code descriptions. Uh, on the other hand, these are things that we do need to be um, um, uh, and such. So uh, read read what they say, and then we can um, uh, talk about these later. So how do we stay up to date with the coding changes? Uh, these are again areas. Think uh, sign up for these. You can then get uh, note notifications regarding the changes in the coding system and your willingness to stay up to date um, uh, is uh, I think would show a significant significant initiative and is something that I would be looking for if I was looking to hire somebody. We had mentioned the coding clinic before uh, Getting access to this is important, and any time that the coding clinic uh, is published, becoming familiar with what it says is an area of opportunity. I do want to mention briefly uh, the CPT system. We will not be covering CPT to any great extent during your course with us. However, being familiar with it to some extent can help build relationships uh, with the medical staff since CPT is how they are paid. And we want to try to be a member of the team. It's a we, not a me. And these can sometimes be a hook uh, that promoting physician buy-in for CDI if we are conversational about this. So for example, uh, physicians are, have different codes as it relates to how uh, they are paid uh, for the work that they do. And notice that uh, higher weighted codes, which are the level five codes, or notice that 02, 03, 04, 05, uh, the higher the number, the more they get paid uh, for these. CMS is going to be uh, changing physician reimbursement that the diagnosis codes that the documentation and the record of the number and complexity of the patient problems addressed and the risk of complications of, and or morbidity or mortality uh, as such are going to be CDI opportunities and so be aware that to the extent that the physician uses the more appropriate severe diagnosis. For example, uh, delirium due to a metabolic encephalopathy instead of just altered mental status will have a favorable impact upon the physician's billing uh, in these regards. And of course, the data that they review, this part of their note can also help as well. This will be a tremendous impact on physician billing in the inpatient environment starting January the 1st of 2023. Uh, we will discuss this to some extent um, when we're uh, in our lectures together. So being familiar with the CPT, uh, just knowing that it exists, uh, being somewhat conversational about this can help you with your medical staff relationships we will not be covering CPT during our time together, but I just want you to be aware of this so that you can make, uh, so that we can talk about this when necessary. So why do hospitals and physicians care about CDI? Why is it that they are hiring you? Why is there a demand for what you know? Well, this has to do with what I call the three R's of CDI, reputation, referrals, 
reimbursement. The reputation has to do with the quality of the hospital, which is being posted upon various websites. The Medicare Hospital Compare, Medicare Physician Compare, U.S. News and World Reports, LeapFrog. Quality is what attracts people to go into certain hospitals, which is the reputation drives referrals. Then, of course, reimbursement. No margin, no mission. And there's a number of mechanisms which is based upon diagnosis or ICD-10 PCS coding that affect not only the payment for the DRG, but also various value-based payments, readmission penalties, cost efficiency measures, funding of insurance plans, state funding of Medicaid plans. So your work in this could fit in any of these three R's, reputation, referrals, reimbursement. And you, this is where, again, your work in this has a tremendous opportunity to affect all of these measures. There's so many different of these there's, that you, we will try to cover, the first thing that we're going to pay most attention to is the Medicare severity DRGs, which is used for inpatient uh, reimbursement. There's also the 3M all payer refined DRGs, which are used for Medicaid programs. The quality measures include mortality, readmission, complications measures, all of which are coding sensitive. There's other inpatient models uh, that you will need that we will not cover uh, the 3M pre preventable complications, readmission measures, visit risk models, but nevertheless, you may be called into these, particularly if you work in certain states or for certain uh, large institutions. Uh, patient safety indicators, inpatient quality indicators, hierarchical condition categories are becoming more and more important uh, particularly with physician-led organizations, uh, outpatient funding, insurance plan funding, so on and so forth. Just so, so many. And also, this isn't just inpatient facility claims. DRGs certainly use the inpatient claims, but many of the quality measures use outpatient claims as well as inpatient claims. So your work in the outpatient environment is going to be important because they're symbiotic, bidirectional, and mutually enhancing in order to get all of these models. And it just varies. So trying to develop systems that does this right to start with uh, is, is something that you will uh, likely grow into. So what we are trying to do with with CDI is we're trying to, me in measuring outcome, there's an observed metric and an expected metric. So the observed metric is just what really happens, the length of stay, the cost, the readmission rate, the mortality rate. That's what happens during a hospital stay. What we are trying to manage is the expected metric, which is based upon documentation and coding uh, that then leads to a calculated risk score. So here's an example of mortality rate in Southern California uh, in 2010. Notice that Cedar sinai on the left has an actual mortality rate of 0.7% with a predicted expected rate of 2%, which is better than expected. On the other hand, if we look at Sharp Memorial, which is a prominent San Diego hospital system, their uh, actual mortality rate was 2.7%, but their expected rate was only 2.8%. So Sharp Memorial looks to be only like an average hospital, whereas Cedar sinai is better than average. Hollywood Presbyterian, on the other hand, has a mortality rate that's higher than expected. 
So ask yourself, would you rather go to a hospital that has better than expected uh, outcomes or one that's only average or worse than expected? Your job will be involved with what I call denominator management or the expected metric with what you see here on the screen. So again, quantity of diagnoses, quality of diagnoses, uh, is 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 necessary. So walk with me through this case. A 65-year-old white male with known New York heart class 4 systolic heart failure due to an ischemic cardiomyopathy is, ad, is admitted for acutely worse orthopnea and edema. We know from the past that our baseline creatinine is 1.0 and the last troponin value was um, normal. Currently, the patient has a systolic blood pressure of 90. The pulse is 90. There's evidence of reduced capillary refill, jugular venous distension, lung rouse, 3 plus edema. The labs now show an increase of the creatinine from 1.0 to 1.6. The troponin is now elevated. There's new ST segment changes inferior laterally, the chest x ray shows pulmonary edema, and the lactate level is elevated at 5, where the normal value is less than 2.0. The doctor only documented decompensated heart failure, pre renal azotemia, elevated lactate level, and troponin leak. As documented, the expected mortality is fairly low. On the other hand, when I look at the creatinine value, instead of saying pre-renal azotemia or acute kidney insufficiency, if I say acute kidney injury, then I've already increased my risk of mortality. It's enough to say demand ischemia but did the patient have an acute myocardial infarction as the reason for the elevated troponin and the, uh, and the um, ST segment depression? And notice that the patient's lactate level was elevated. Uh, the patient has kidney impairment. Cardiogenic shock uh, is... Uh, is, uh, would need to be documented to demonstrate that this patient has a high likelihood of dying. So the predicament the coder has is that while there's various abstraction tools that we can use to anticipate the expected uh, mortality and certain data collection forms that many hospitals use to collect this information, CMS and these other ranking companies use coded data, which you then will need to be familiar with with some of the coding language so that as you see here on the screen, terms that you see on the left cannot be coded with their alternative language that we have here on the right. And I'm not going to go through all of these because we will cover these during our time together. Suffice it to say that there's a broad, broad, broad uh, experience with what you will need to know. Certain words that many physicians use, as we see here on the left, will need to be substituted with alternative ICD-10 PCS language. And, um, and as you can see, translating clinical language to coding language is a primary CDI responsibility. So let's do a little CDI as a practice for you to uh, for you to uh, think about. So take a look at this record, and I'm going to give you a minute of this recording to take a look at it. See in your mind. Well, first of all, what there's only one diagnosis that the coder can code based on looking at this one record. 
See if you can find it. I'll give you a minute to take a look at it. So we're just kind of looking at this, and let's see what we see. Uh, we see the patients on Levifed and normal saline, patients on Cipro, clindamycin, vancomycin, Primaquin. Gosh, there's unresponsive, um, pretty sick. Um, serum bicarb is 18. Uh, the toes are discolored on the right foot. That's not too good. Liver enzymes are markedly elevated, but they're getting better. Uh, the white count's 15,000. Still don't see any diagnosis yet on any of these. Um, the chest X-ray was has atelectasis, but of course we can't code from X-ray reports. The doctor would have to tell us. You know what that is. Um, sputum culture has Canada. Uh, again, we can't um, code from lab reports. The doctor would have to say it's um, significant. 41-year-old with history of HIV. Remember, history of means no longer present, not being treated. Um, with F, which probably means fever and decreased mental status. Um, gosh, what, what, what does F mean? You know, um, the CD4 count is 98. Uh, we can't code that. Um, sputum with Canada. Can't code that. What is the can? You know what does that mean? Um, patient on Levifed. Well, what's the Levifed treating? Um, neuro, no change in mental status. That's what I guess MS means. But the um, MRI of the brain is pending. Neuro following. Can't do much with that. Hey, there's a diagnosis. We can actually code the thrombocytopenia. Let me see if I can get, see that thrombocytopenia? That's the only diagnosis that we can code, you know, based upon this record. So, you know, why is the patient on Levifed? Why are we using Cipro, clindamycin, vancomycin, or Primaquin? We can't code unresponsive. Is the patient unconscious? or comatose. Does the patient have an acidosis manifested by the bicarb of 18? The liver function studies are elevated. Uh, I would say with the metabolic acidosis, the need for Levifed, the patient's probably in shock. I would say the patient's probably in septic shock. With the CPK and LDH being elevated, is there a um, is there a rhabdomyolysis going on or a critical illness myopathy? The white count goes again with the patient being um, septic. That would go with the fever. Is the sputum with Canada a colonization? More than likely, uh, about the only way to make the diagnosis of Canada pneumonia is to do an open lung biopsy. I uh, can't really trust sputums with Canada in it. Uh, does this patient have AIDS with the CD4 count of 98? And I would say yes. In fact, the Primaquin is probably treating um, pneumocystis. And is the thrombocytopenia that we noticed above primary or secondary? These are, again, examples of what we are listening for. So why do we have to deal with what we're dealing with? Notice that the coding system that we just described is run by four entities, the CDC, the CMS, Medicare, the American Hospital Association, and the American Health Information Management Association. Who's not on the list? Doctors. So the rules were made by non-physicians, which of course are extremely non-friendly to physicians. 
So your role again as a clinical documentation specialist is to bridge the gap between the coding language that's not run by doctors and physicians who have their own language and how you reconcile the two will be, um, you will be responsible for. And the reason that the coding system is different is that coding is for administrative purposes, not for direct patient care. ICD-10 is based only on provider documentation, not a clinical abstraction. The physician must use the magic words that drive the code assignment, not necessarily the clinical terms that he or she reads in the literature. So the bottom line is that uh, CDI affects the three R's of, C, of, of the three R's, reputation, referrals, and reimbursement. This is an exciting field for you to get involved with, and I certainly look forward to spending more time with you uh, to dig a little deeper, to unpack this, uh, to increase our critical thinking in this regard and such. So we certainly look forward to your participation. We hope that you study this, maybe listen to this lecture once or twice uh, to this, because that, I think, will give you a head start uh, with what we will be discussing. So subsequently, we're going to go over uh, the DRG systems. We're going to go into the deep dive, uh, the deep dives of the quality measures, CDI practice. Uh, we hope to cover this and to give you some experience uh, in what you'll be doing and uh, get you ready for that first interview. So thank you so much for uh, your participation in this uh, online uh, meeting. Uh, we hope to get the slides to you. Uh, well, if you don't have the slides, please call uh, the CDI search group. Uh, ask for Juliana. Uh, she should be able to get these for you. Um, and be aware that this is the acronym directory that's at the end of your slide deck. Uh, knowing what these acronyms are in my opinion, will help you be more conversational as to uh, to some of the words that I might be using. I will slip up and probably not describe these uh, to start with, but uh, to the extent that you can look at some of these and become more familiar uh, with these, I think will help you uh, not only navigate the course, but also work the lingo with your potential employers. Well, this is the end of our session today. Thank you so much again, Dr. Jim Kennedy. I certainly appreciate what you do. Know that I'm cheering for you. I'm praying for you. God bless you today, and uh, we'll chat with you in class. Bye-bye.